uh, of the Conservative Young Women's Organisation and Managing Director of One Young World. As I say, 0345 973 if you'd like to put a question to our panel. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has had to be driven away by police after becoming surrounded by protesters near Parliament. The Shadow Foreign Secretary, David Lammy, was also heckled earlier. He's told LBC it was ferocious. We were accosted by a rabble of what appeared to be people chanting about the vaccine, but also repeating slurs that we heard in Parliament last week in relation to Jimmy Savile. Two people have been arrested. Boris Johnson says the government's setting tough targets for dealing with the NHS backlog in England. Figures show 300,000 cancer patients weren't able to see an oncologist within the two-week target last year. The Chancellor's being blamed for a hold-up in publishing the government's COVID recovery plan. Mason Greenwood is no longer sponsored by Nike. They've dropped the Manchester United striker after he was arrested on suspicion of rape and assault. And the amount you can be fined in private car parks in England and Wales is being cut. In most cases, it means the maximum penalty will be £50 instead of £100. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 57 points at 75.73. The pound buys $1.35 and €1.18. LBC Weather Breeze Easy and mild in the south tonight with some rain, blustery showers further north, a low of two degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lucinda Horsley. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's two minutes past eight on LBC. I'm Ian Dale. Now, we have a stellar panel with us this evening to answer your questions. Can't imagine what you're going to be asking about, can you? 0345 6060 973. Uh, John Nicholson is SMP MP for Ockel and South Perthshire. Is it Perthshire or Perthshire? Perthshire. Or whatever. Um, he's also the party's really DC spokesperson. Kate Mulby is a columnist for the I newspaper. She's a writer and a critic. Ella Robertson Mackay is chair of Conservative Young Women and managing director of One Young World. And in just a moment, we're going to be joined by Lord Bird, John Bird, founder of The Big Issue and Crossbench Peer. You can, of course, watch us on Global Player as well. But get your calls in right now on 0345 6060 973. O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. Tweet at LBC. Text eight four eight five zero. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Um, as if by magic, John has appeared. Welcome, John. Um, right, let's get on with the first question. It's Adrian in Bournemouth. Hello, Adrian. Hi, how are you doing? You right? All right, thank you. What would you like to say? Uh, well, firstly, I'm fuming, but let's not go down that road. Right. Um, Donald Trump spent many, many, many years dog-whistling to the right so that when he needed them, they were there for him when he wanted to cling on to power. And I want to know whether these guys think, are, are they as worried as I am that Boris might try and cling on to power to that degree? John Nicholson. Um, I worked in American politics. I'm immensely sad to see what's happened uh, to Mer American politics. There are similarities, but there's big differences. Um, and our system is not the same as the American system. That said, the scenes that we've seen outside the House of Commons tonight are absolutely disgraceful. And it shows how important it is not to feed the far-right conspiracy theorists. Because what we've seen is a transference of conspiracy theory lies fed by the Prime Minister about Jimmy Savile, against the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. And he has been pursued by thugs in the streets of central London tonight. The Prime Minister, I think, bears huge responsibility, as do the cowardly ministers who are not prepared to stand up and say these are lies. I had the disinformation minister before me in the culture 
uh, select committee and I asked him directly about this and he was not prepared co- to condemn what Boris Johnson had said. If you can't get the disinformation minister to condemn Sorry, disinformation, what, who will? What's his real title or her real title? Well, disinformation is one of the... the, the, the one of his uh, portfolios. Right. He, he covers disinformation. Who is this? Chris Philp. Right. He covers disinformation as part of his portfolio. Kate Maltby. Well, Adrian, um, I'm fuming too, and I think your question gets right to the heart of it. But there are two separate things here that I think we need to distinguish between. The first thing to say is that the claim that Boris Johnson made in the Commons about Keir Starmer was completely unacceptable. Um, it was just the latest in a number of things that make him completely and utterly unfit for for office. And as I think Ian said earlier this evening, he should go back to the House of Commons and he should apologise. Not just that, he should also mean it. He should mean it and he should be able to talk about why it was wrong. But secondly, I do think it's important to distinguish comments made by the Prime Minister, however irresponsible they are, and the whipping up of a particular mob, a particular group of people today, because to be quite frank, no one gets that radicalised in a week. I mean, and any of us who have been around in Westminster, who've been physically present over the last few weeks, can tell you that there has been a horrifically febrile atmosphere of protest already, that certain of the characters who you can recognise on the video have been involved in far-right and far-left conspiracy theories, often where the far-left and the far-right meet Piers Corbyn. I'm now told it's being reported that he was present. Um, And I get worried when we draw very clear lines between rhetoric by any person and action by other people because I was listening to your show earlier Ian as I came in and you had a caller saying of course there are people who can't control themselves and then when they hear the Prime Minister speak of course they're going to go well actually that's not true everyone can control themselves they're responsible for their own actions and I actually think there's a much bigger problem than just the Prime Minister's statements which is no one should be that radicalised already we shouldn't have that much of a problem in our society with right-wing conspiracies. How do you know if he's sincere you both said he should apologise and be sincere in his apology. You can tell when someone means an apology, can't you? I mean, we've not seen, with Boris Johnson. We, we, well, we've seen enough apologies insincere. over the years. We, we we know that Tony Blair, um, he was the, the arch apologiser, and I think he generally did mean it. I, I'm not sure whether we can say that. Well, in fact, I know we can't say that with Boris Johnson. Well, exactly. Yeah, I think Ian and I are being hopeful. I think we're being hopeful rather than expecting. Boris Johnson has actually now responded to the events of tonight. He's tweeted this. The behaviour directed at the leader of the opposition tonight is absolutely disgraceful. All forms of harassment of our elected representatives are completely unacceptable. Sounds a bit like Jeremy Corbyn there, doesn't it? All forms, blah, blah, blah. I thank the police for responding swiftly. I then quote tweeted that. And I said, I presume there will be a follow-up tweet apologising for your outrageous remarks in the Commons which directly provoked these appalling scenes. You should immediately go to the House and make a statement apologising. It's the right thing to do. Do the right thing. Hear, hear. Ella robertson Mackay, you draw the short straw this evening. Uh, (laughs) I mean, you are a Conservative. Can you defend that? I'm not sure why he said it, to be honest. I, I had thought maybe, well, it was it just cut and thrust of politics, but clearly to a lot of people it's gone well beyond the cut and thrust of what we expect in the House. It was inaccurate and he shouldn't have said it. And I think clearly to some people it has, as Adrian pointed out, acted as a dog whistle. And therefore this demands beyond a clarification. This does demand an apology. Um, and we, we know from what we've seen in America with really troubling conspiracy theories like QAnon that paedophilia really is the red rag to the bull. And I think it's really, really important that this clarification is made. We, we cannot be letting British politics descend into what we've seen in the United States. Should it go? Well, that's above my pay grade. That is for the, the parliamentary well, party to decide. Well, you're, you're a chair of Conservative Young Women. You presumably have a view. Uh, I think, like a lot of people, and I'm, I'm not hiding behind the reports, but I really, really want to see what is in this Sue Gray report. Not only, uh, you know, we've seen one or two photos, but apparently there are 300. I would like to see all of them. I would like to know, were people whipping out the odd uh, bottle of wine? Was there a party where Wilfred Johnson's swing was broken? I really I want to know what happened. I want to know what role our elected officials played and who was responsible for what. And at, them point, at that point, I think it's fair for, for people to say, you know, whether... How how, how egregious it was or it wasn't. I think it's really important that everyone in number 10, new or old, 
does not underestimate the scale of insults to the nation. And I think it's a really, really serious moment for everyone involved in public life to consider their behaviour. Uh, but personally, I really do want to see the full police report. OK. Um, John Bird, do, do you see the analogy that Adrian, our questioner, is drawing here between what happened in America and what's happening in this country now? Or is it exaggerated? Um, yeah, I mean, I see that there's, uh, you know, you could make a, a connection with them. I mean, I, I actually... Uh, don't really uh, agree with this argument over uh, whether Boris Johnson is a liar and a cheat. I don't agree with the argument over whether or not he uh, uh, should, you, you know, you can tell whether he's genuine or not. Politicians, are on, on, on the whole, have to tailor what they say, and he didn't tailor it. What I'm interested in is the logic behind why he would say that. That's what I'm interested in. And because I think you'll find logic even in the most illogical things. And what he was trying to do was say, look, I can't be blamed for everything. And this guy over here is opposing me, can't be blamed for everything. Uh, because on his watch, uh, Saville got away with blue murder. So that is the argument. If there had been some clarity about what he meant, then we wouldn't be having this argument. The problem is, and this is where I agree with my fellow panelists, the problem is you should not be moving into an area where you could be misinterpreted or you could be seen as being spurious uh, and dismissive about uh, a party leader. So that's where I do agree. Uh, my argument about all of this, by the way, about the Prosecco and all that, I think we missed a brilliant chance of changing the government and we missed it just before Christmas when the Owen Patterson thing came. That was where we could really have learned something. We could have learned that there are people leaving government who, because they've been in government and have had a public office, can go off and enrich themselves and end up with millions and millions and millions of pounds. To me, that was something that the government should have fallen over. This, I think, we will not lose, we will not learn as much as we could. And that is why I believe that you need to separate, you need to separate government decision making from who decides who gets the government contract. If you want to get rich in Britain, get a government contract. Okay, John. You're absolutely right about Owen Patterson, but my goodness, I think you're being far too kind in your interpretation of what the Prime Minister was up to. This is a guy who's operated in exactly the same way for decades. He knows exactly what he was doing. He wasn't saying that there is, um, that there is uh, overall general uh, guilt at the, at the DPP over the Savile affair. I've got his words in front of me. He said this, this is what, he's actually, what he actually said, because I thought this would come up. He said of Keir Starmer, quote, he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile. He wasn't talking about the DPP in general. He used the word he very deliberately to make a link between Jimmy Savile and the failure to prosecute and Keir Starmer. It was a foul link and it was a lie. And the corollary from this, of course, is that if you look on Twitter now, a lot of people who want to think ill of Keir Starmer are tweeting, yeah, he, did, he didn't prosecute any of these Muslim grooming gangs in the north of England either. Somebody's put a list of all of the ones that were prosecuted from 2008 to 2013. So nobody's dealing with facts he no. here. But and he's my, political op he's my political opponent. But I do not think one should lie about your political opponents, especially in this egregious way. So, you know, I go on the record saying it was a lie. We're in this situation because what should have happened before Christmas, we should have, the government should have fallen over what it did, how, over, how it over, fallen, over how all of the, fallen? all of the things that they were doing around government contract. The gravy train arrived in this country, the COVID gravy train arrived, and thousands of people made a hit on that, and hundreds of big businesses made money. Tory people, backbenchers people, were never going to vote down the government on that issue, I have to tell you, John. But we didn't even make it an issue, did we? 
Well, I think a lot of people did make it an issue and the, so the government lost a by-election over it. Um, Kate? I wanted to go back to this point about prosecuting journalists because I think this is actually one where um, my panellists, my co-panellists have reminded me... I was too quick to say you can't draw a line between Boris's comments and and the crowd because when you listen to what they were saying on that footage, they did shout at Starmer, didn't they? Why were you prosecuting journalists? Why were you prosecuting journalists? And now that... That is a line that has, again, come straight out of the Prime Minister's playbook. And I think I should also add here, I'm the deputy chair of something called Index on Censorship. We're a charity that um, actively supports journalists against authoritarian governments and intrusion around the world. I have to tell you, I'm a lot more worried about the online safety bill that this Conservative government is bringing in to try and limit what people can say on the internet, to try and limit what kind of journalism can be done on the internet, than any of us have ever been on about Keir Starmer. He's never been on anyone's uh, media freedom What list as the enemy. And you'll remember, of course, that Boris Johnson conspired to have a journalist beaten up well, with his pal. Well, I think pal. we should be careful mm. about that. Oh, I don't think we should be careful about it at all. He, we've all heard the recording. He conspired to have a, a, a journalist beaten up by one of his pals. And we know that he we I, did. I think your wording there is rather inaccurate, <coughs> I may say so, John. What, um, what I should have avoided he was, on, he was a recipient of a phone call from Darius Guppy and he didn't object. I know you could, if you if you want to describe that as conspiring, fine. But it wasn't his finest hour. I think we can all agree on that. Um, Ella, let's come back to you for a second. <laughs> I was talking earlier in the program about the article which he wrote what, four or five years ago, describing Muslim women mm. looking like letterboxes. Yeah. Now. I had people phoning into this programme saying that a friend of mine is a Muslim woman, she was wearing a niqab down the street and someone ripped her niqab off. And it was a direct result of this. It it gave licence to people to do it. That's exactly what's happened here again, isn't it? Actions have consequences. Careless talk in the Second World War cost lives. Luckily, no lives have been cost here, but... Words have weight. And the Prime Minister's words carry significant weight in the mind of the British people. And I think that this really comes down to tone and the tone of our politics. And I think that most people watching at home when they see what happens in the House feel frustrated. They feel that it doesn't represent them. It doesn't represent the civil kind of conversations that they like to have in the pub, the kind of conversations we're having here. And I think it's upon all of us to try and raise and elevate the public tone. Um, and I think that's that's right across the country. And I, I really, really implore all of our elected officials to do their bit to raise the tone because we've seen what happens in America when there's a race to the bottom when it comes to tone. And it's, it's regrettable and devastating to watch. It should, this is not the direction we should be going in. Um, having said that, I think that sometimes, you know, things can get blown out of proportion. People can spend far too much time retweeting a meme of someone on the back bench of the House of Commons rather than focusing on what, you know, the legislative agenda that's actually at play that's making a difference to people's lives. Do, do we think that all politicians need to really examine what they're saying? Not, not to say that people can't give instant responses, mm. but when you plan a response, and I am going to criticise Keir Starmer here, when he called the Delta variant the Johnson variant, Quite. I did think to myself, come on. Have we really debased ourselves that much? Yeah. I mean, this is happening all over the place, isn't it? It's and, not just and in one party. Not, not it, to spar unnecessarily, but uh, you have Wes Streeting today calling the NHS backlog the Tory backlog. And as John will know, in Scotland, one in 10 Scots is on an NHS backlog. So, I mean, you know, all of this name calling and clap back, slam down culture, I just think it's just horrid. And I think it's not helpful. And I think, I think the public don't actually appreciate it in the way that some pundits think that they do. Right. Well, I'm sure we've got more questions on this. Adrian, just a quick response from you to your to the answers that you've heard. Um, well, yeah, I, I go along with my. I, I, it frustrates me a little bit, but, but I, maybe I'm the only person that can see what I can see, which means I'm I'm wrong. I don't know. But do you think Donald Trump used to brand everybody? He had he had you know he had Crooked Hillary, he had Sleepy Joe. Boris has managed to brand himself pretty well over the last few months as Boris the liar. And I think, I genuinely believe this is this was his game plan, to pick something that was even worse than that and brand him with it. And he knows it's never going to wash off now. Adrian, I- thank you very much indeed. We'll come to more of your calls in a second. It's 18 minutes past eight. LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 21 minutes past eight, let me reintroduce my panel to you. Uh, Lord John Bird is here, founder of The Big Issue, crossbench peer. John Nicholson, who is the SNP's DCMS spokesperson. Kate Mulby is a columnist for the I newspaper. And Ella Robertson Mackay is chair of Conservative Young Women. Right, next question. This is from Priyanka in Oxford. Hello, Priyanka. Uh, good evening. Um, I mean, after this whole soap opera over the last month over letters of the 1922 committee and so on, is the Conservative Party really capable of disciplining, let alone changing its prime minister? The Conservative Party is quite good at changing its leaders, but um, it hasn't done it yet. Um, so the question is, is the Conservative Party incapable of disciplining the prime minister? Ella Robertson Mackay. I think that they're absolutely capable of it, if that's what it comes to. I think I can absolutely see why the backbenchers want to see the police report before they do or they don't decide to put in a letter. But I have absolute faith in Graham Brady and the Conservative Party constitution that if... Uh, you know, if the number of letters are received, that due process will be followed. Um, I, I really, really can see why in the milieu of media reporting about uh, rules and regulations in Parliament, people might have concern. But I think when it comes to these sorts of matters, um, there are some there are some backbenchers who absolutely love to uh, enforce electoral rules and uh, they'll be rubbing their hands with glee at the opportunity to do so. What will happen, though, if, if the 54 limit is reached and there is a vote of confidence and Boris Johnson wins it by a very narrow margin? I mean, that, that's almost the worst of all worlds, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be a... That we've seen that situation play out in fairly recent history. Um, but I think that we've got May council elections coming up and I think that will be a really great opportunity to read what not just what the media and what the MPs are saying, but what the public think. I think the media predicted that we'd get schlacked last time and it was a fantastic result for services across the country in May last year. And it'll be a really great opportunity for the people to have their say. John Bird. Well, I think the Conservative Party is very, very different from the one I've known through many, many decades. Uh, and you can look at the fact that you've got Boris Johnson, who is non-ideological, opportunistic, uh, always, you know, always willing to change his mind uh, and do many, many things. And if you look at the fact that his his backbone largely is, is a, a very big part of it is working class, I think maybe the Conservative Party is going to be listening to its members and listening to the electorate in a way that it's probably never done before because it is not the traditional Conservative Party. And I've had many discussions now with Conservative MPs and you would you can close your eyes and in some ways they do appear as though they're more Labour than they are Conservative. And I, I think all of those changes are, are the result of what... Boris managed to achieve in 2019. But I do believe that the party is now listening because it has to. It's interesting what you say about the Tory party membership because generally they stay loyal to whoever the leader is. If you think back to, you and I can remember 1975 when the, the Tory party membership, they didn't have a vote in that leadership election, but they were very loyal to Ted Heath. And even when Ian Duncan Smith was overthrown, I think a lot of the membership was still very loyal to him. Um, Kate Maltby. Well, I agree with that last point, particularly about Ian Duncan Smith, but we've been talking so far about whether or not the Conservative Party is capable of changing its leader. Obviously, eventually it is. What I find really interesting about Priyanka's question is this word disciplining. She's actually asked, is the Conservative Party incapable of disciplining the Prime Minister? I, I think that they probably are incapable of disciplining the Prime Minister because they're not really interested in disciplining the Prime Minister. No political party is interested in disciplining its own leader, at least not for grandiose ethical reasons they're interested in winning effective leadership and they're going to stick behind him um, if he can if he can deliver wins but what I what I think is behind this question is really interesting is over the, the years I've been involved in quite a few conversations both sort of privately and publicly about um, standards in the House of Commons public you know public behavior standards for MPs particularly around the Me Too movement but also around corruption lobbying things like that and in all of those conversations what we eventually get back to is a kind of fundamental problem which is when you try to impose sort of HR standards or civil service codes of conduct 
on um, elected politicians, you come up against this question of whether any unelected civil servant or any unelected body should be someone imposing some kind of sanction, which is sort of what we've been looking at around the Sue Gray report, or whether the public has to be the final discipliner Because, of course, we live in a democracy and having some civil servant come along and say, you know, your favourite person you've all voted for, well, he's been a bad boy, so I'm going to just take him out of power. That creates a whole lot of problems, even if the civil servant is actually correct and even Mm. if ethically we agree with her. So um, at the end of the day, I think we, the electorate, have to be the people who deliver discipline if we're talking about moral discipline. And in the case of Boris Johnson, I hope that we as the electorate eventually do. Um, John Nicholson, there will be people in the Tory party, probably many Tory MPs, who take the view, well, Boris will be Boris. You've got to let Boris be Boris, because if you don't let Boris be Boris, he's not that election-winning machine that he's proved to be in the past. And, I mean, you can say that about many... I mean, people used to say that about Alex Salmond as well. He had his defects, but he he won elections, and people forgave him for for some of his defects. I don't think we quite knew what all the defects uh, were. This is very true. So you will say no, I did. At that point... No, no, at the at the time I was a I was a journalist and I used to follow him and uh, I certainly had no idea uh, about the about the defects but we're we're talking about Boris Johnson you know I had MPs coming up to me and saying to me I'm going to vote for Boris Johnson he's absolutely ghastly I dislike him um I know it's all going to end very badly because we all knew it would end up either with a sex scandal or a financial scandal or perhaps a combination of the two, nobody thought he was going to be cheered out of Downing Street, I think. But Tory MPs had a very clear idea of what they were voting for. And they thought their party was facing an existential crisis. And he was the person who would save them. And all the problems down the line, they would worry about them down the line. And to, to an extent, they were right. Yeah, Because it was all, at that point, we, we have to remember what the circumstances were at the time. It was all about... Nigel Farage. Brexit, we like, we, we, we remember. Done, wasn't it? But the question posed, I think, is a good one. Do Tory MPs have the, the guts to discipline him? And of course, one day they will do. They're absolutely vicious, the Conservative Party. They will... They're slavering sycophants <laughs> uh, walking past behind them saying, oh, your, your majesty, anything else we can do for you at this time? And then suddenly the knives will be out and he'll be defenestrated. Suddenly, out the windy, he will, he will go. We've seen it with Tory leader after Tory leader after Tory leader. You mentioned Ted, Ted Heath. They were all adoring uh, Ted Heath at one point, and then they viciously stabbed him in the back and the front, did the same to Thatcher. They'll do it to Boris Johnson. His and, day of reckoning but, is coming. But it goes back to what I was saying. If they don't see their leader as an election winner, they will get rid. That, exactly. That's, that's, I mean, if you don't learn it's from only history, because he's you a repeat winner. it. You know, he's a winner, so... He, lo- he stops being a winner and he's out the door. And all the all the new 2019 Tories, uh, they're suddenly waking up and they're seeing what he really stands for. And but I don't he agree won with them. Their seats, didn't he? That's the that's the problem they've got because they look at all the p- possible successors. It was the emperors, and they think, well, are they going to win me my seat back in the do way you, that Boris did? Do you seriously think they look at Boris Johnson and think that he'll allow them to keep these red wall? Tory seats at the next election. They all know they're one-term Conservatives. Some of them do. I mean, Christian Wakeford, the one that defected to Labour, he he was certainly of that view. That in, I mean, he came and did interviews in the studio, and I was astonished at some of the things he was saying. And it was clearly because he didn't give a damn anymore because he knew that he would lose his seat. And he knew he'd get a nice uh, Labour selection in the same seat and oh, we'll would roll on. We'll see, won't we? Um, we'll come to more of your calls in a second. You're listening to Cross Question on LBC or watching it on Global Player, maybe. It's half past eight. Let's get the latest news headlines from Lucinda Horsley. Two people have been arrested after the Labour leader was driven away from Parliament by police after being surrounded by protesters. Their repeated comments the Prime Minister made towards Sir Keir Starmer about Jimmy Savile last week. Boris Johnson has called the behaviour absolutely disgraceful. Britain sending another 350 troops to Poland in a show of support to Ukraine. Vladimir Putin is meeting the French President Emmanuel Macron for talks on the troops Russia has gathered on the border. 
Footballer Mason Greenwood is no longer sponsored by Nike. They've dropped the Manchester United player after he was arrested on suspicion of rape and assault. LBC weather, breezy and mild in the south tonight with some rain, blustery showers further north, a low of two degrees. LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.34 on LBC. Uh, John Bird, John Nicholson, Kate Maltby and Ella Robertson Mackay still with me to answer your questions. I always get a frisson of excitement when we get a call from the Republic of Ireland. I have no idea, there's no logic to it, but I'm getting that frisson now from Kieran in Limerick. Hello, Kieran. Hi, Ian. How are you? Um, Hi, very well. Um, great. Um, I'm just wondering... Is the time for all Etonians presenting policies like levelling up in British Parliament coming to an end? <laughs> um, John Bird, it's slightly incongruous, isn't it, to have an old Etonian talking about levelling up, I suppose? Not really. I mean, what did Benjamin Disraeli talk about? One Britain, you know, one country. I mean, the Tories have a remarkable list on occasions of of rallying to the to the needs. I'm not saying they always uh, fulfil the needs, but I, I'm not, you see, I'm not a classist. I've been a classist. I spent too long being a classist. I really don't care who delivers the levelling up. I don't care who uh, creates the equality. I don't think where it comes from. The fact that it it's that uh, a whole line, a whole slew of old Etonians have come this way. I mean, I blame, I blame them for things other than the fact that they're old Etonians. I blame them mainly because of the fact that they didn't address the fact that we're a low wage economy, we're a low investment economy, we are not an economy that knows how to build new opportunities for people in poverty. They don't know how to morph people out of poverty. They have 
give they'll give people a handout but not a hand up so these are the kind of consi considerations the fact that they're old etonians or they come from you know gas street comprehensive is not my problem i got rid of that problem a long time ago do you not think, though, that it's quite difficult for somebody who's got Boris Johnson's background to understand what it's like in some places in the country that need levelling up? Well, I think that goes for virtually everybody. And it really doesn't matter because the thing is, when what, whatever part of society you come from, when you join Parliament, there's a kind of pattern, there's a kind of... You know, go to Oxford, uh, Oxbridge, most of the people, irrespective of what part of society they come from, they go to Oxbridge and they suddenly become different kinds of people. And they become uh, uh, people who have absolutely no idea how the poor live or what we need to do. So my, I'm not a great lover of this idea that it's just the public schools who have lost the plot. I believe that there are many, many working class people um, uh, Labourites who have joined, who've gone through Oxbridge and all that and gone through university and they get into Parliament and they don't know where reality is. They leave it behind. And I think that's one of the problems with, with Parliament. The other, my big problem is why are we not drawing on a larger gene pool than the old Etonians or the people who came up through the trade union movement or the lecturers at university or the people who, uh, you know, run companies like, like estate agents. Where are the people who have done real jobs like miners? Where are the people who uh, have done jobs like nurses? I mean, the only people you find in politics are the top nurses. You don't find people who... Uh, who, who are nurses I think or John, police officers. John, 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 John's best friend, Nadine mm -hmm. Doris, she was a nurse, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I haven't spoken well, to Nadine uh, today. One I'm swallow a, doesn't check make a summer. Text messages. <laughs> I think she's gone off to Saudi Arabia to fun, fun times in the sun. Uh, well, John, I'm first generation to go to university. Uh, nobody in my family had ever gone. I think if you look at our SNP group, in fact, they are a representative. Kezia Dugdale said they look like Scotland, the former Labour Party uh, leader. We we have a wide representation from uh, from the early 20s through to 70s, big age difference as well. I like your reference to Benjamin Dis Disraeli. And of course, I loved um, I loved reading uh, Benjamin Disraeli at, at university, but he was an outsider. He didn't go to one of the posh schools. He was he was Jewish, and I think uh, after a quick Google, I've discovered that he went to uh, he went to university in Walthamstow, exactly. So he really fought his his way up. You're absolutely right about the Conservative Party. They draw from a very narrow uh, social gene pool. Um, far too many old Etonians. Nothing wrong with going to fair. Eton. I don't think that's but, fair. But, I, I think, but, used to be fair, isn't anymore. Well, I think you could make a case that after this last election, it it is it has changed. But look mm. at their leadership over over many many uh, years. There's a you know there's a few from outside it, but pretty consistently. And I know you're going to tell me about John Major. You can mention oh, Ted. John Major, can I come in on Ian this, Duncan though? Smith. Go on, Ella. So I chair the Conservative Young Women Group. So we're trying to get more young women into public life. So by definition, I'm interested in people who didn't go to Eton. Um, I think you know, we are the only party to have had a female leader, let alone let alone two female prime ministers. Um, if you look at our front bench and the great office of state, I mean, it looks much more like Britain than. Uh, than it has done in the past. And I think you know, from 2019, we are a different party. We are drawing from different areas of the country, different backgrounds. Um, and I think it's so, so, so important that we continue to do that. But I think ultimately the public don't really care where people chose to send their children to school when they were 11. What they care about is their is their, yes, their intellectual understanding of the policy issues of the day, but it's their basic human empathy. It's the ability to look at someone and go, gosh, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. This is something that we could all Is experience. that what's going wrong? I, I'm, I'm not saying that it is what's going wrong, but I think your, people's ability to empathise is much more important than than their educational CV. Johnson well, doesn't have any ability to empathise. We've seen that over the last few weeks. But can I take it back to the actual question, if that's OK? Um, 
Kieran asked, has the time come for Etonians to stop talking about levelling up? Well, if we're talking about levelling up specifically, the cabinet minister who has been behind that project and who has been working on that project for a very long time now is Michael Gove, who is not an Etonian, who is, um, you know, whatever you think of, of Michael Gove, he's not someone who, who came from a, you know, he wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He had, a, in many ways, you know, a lot of financial challenges in the family in which he was growing up, and he was propelled by academic success and by scholarships all the way to Oxford and beyond, which takes me back slightly, to, I think, to um, Bird's comment about universities and elites and this idea that, you know, the real problem isn't isn't where you went to school, but whether you joined an elite at the age, you know, in your 20s and then became detached from the world. I'm afraid that I think it's great that we have highly selective universities and that people who work extremely hard and who go through those selection mm. processes do often end up leading the country um, working at the top level and I'm afraid when it comes to you know people with real experience of trades again which I think is really important or professions I do want the top nurses in there I do want people who have been you know exceptional wherever they have come from but I don't see why you know our our leaders in parliament should be ordinary in any way mm. and if I can get really controversial go for on, a moment throw on. some real red meat in I think what makes things even worse is that we live in a time when we when MPs are pilloried uh, for every penny they earn, whereas, in fact, compared to other high achievers and leaders in this country, they often earn considerably less. So if you want to attract highly successful talent and maybe talent that went to Oxbridge and then went did really well, the opposite, I think, of what some of my panellists want. Good but luck in selling You that are going to have to <laughs> raise the amount you pay. And to sum up, this is one of my favourite statistics, though. There are only two millennials who have been cabinet ministers yet. Can you, Ian, you'll know who they are. Two millennials who've been cabinet ministers. Well, I'll tell you, and then mm. I'll ask you again. Robert Jenrick, Rishi Sunak. Mm. What do they both have in common? They're conservatives. Rich wives. Because there is something about structural wealth in this country and, frankly, the need to have it to go far in politics, which is wrong, which is a massive problem, but it is part of the fact that you don't earn an income that some of these people have been led to expect. Ian, that is clearly that's the mistake... that's why they need to marry you, it. That they is, need to marry it. That is clearly the mistake that you and I are making, so I'm going to go straight out of the studio and start looking for a wealthy wealthy wife, because that's that's very good advice. But, You're not uh, a millennial, I'm afraid to say. She's also not the wife-looking sort. Yes, exactly. But <laughs> uh, I'm interested. I, 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 I'm I an old friend of, of Michael Gove's, which sometimes surprises uh, people. It's great that you say that Michael Gove is in charge of levelling up, and he shows that he comes from a... We know he comes from a um, not a privileged background. Why do you think he felt the need to change his voice so dramatically so that he sounds as if he came from Eton. What does that say about does the party? He? Oh, I think so, don't no, you? No, oh. not at all. It I sounds think that's posh. quite the way, an assumption the, of yours to me. I mean, the I, way that Michael but Gold, Margaret Thatcher did the same. Oh, she did? Oh, she, she ended up sounding as though she three came decades, the shows. Three decades before, but yeah. Michael Gove doesn't no, sound... he still sounds Scottish. Well, he's a council house does he boy. sound posh Scottish? I think it might there is, there is a posh what Scottish, time of the evening. <laughs> he, he switches on and off. His, 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 voice, his voice changes. It goes from quite northeast to, I would say, very... I t to be honest, I don't really care what kind of accent someone has. I really care about you. What but if you feel you have doing. to change your voice to get on, what does that say about society? I'm not sure it's really the office of a friend society? to make assumptions about, um, and you say you're a friend of Michael Gove's, to make assumptions about at what point someone may have changed their voice and very specifically why. That's quite a sort of psychological... But in my experience, and I've known quite a few people who did, you know, and I sound inc much posher than most of my family, to be frank. I know I speak why? like this. I know that why? my grandparents and my parents didn't. How people, did you used to sound? I, that's not oh, what I'm saying. Oh, <laughs> I didn't say I, I've changed my voice. I said I sound posher a generation oh, down, which mm. is quite different. But I have known a lot of people go through institutions like Oxbridge and find their voices changing, just as people change their voices when they go to America or they know? go and live in another country. Yeah. This is this is something that is acted upon people rather than necessarily being a conscious And, and as someone what, what who is a... What makes you think that somebody going to Oxbridge is a, a, a very carefully 
created somebody, then goes into government and then does a good job. Because I don't believe that we live in the kind of elite uh, mm. world that you're talking about. I think we're, we live in a world where incredibly educated people are making mistake after mistake after mistake. I mean, we live in a world which is going down the tubes because of climate change and all those sorts of things. We don't have, uh, we, we don't have an elite. We don't live in a world where that there is a guarantee that somebody goes to a top university and then is going to deliver the goods. Ellie, you want as to as a on. Scot living in England, I can empathise with well. people whose accent changes. Uh, <laughs> if we have a glass of wine afterwards, you might find it changes again. Um, but I think that, to Kate's point, though, I really do want to come back on about, I really want the elites of the professions in Parliament. Like, of course we do to some extent, but I really would say, if you do anyone's job for a day, whether it's a bartender or a supermarket worker or a lorry driver, it is so much harder than you think it is. And it's not not just the CEOs of professions or the head of nursing trusts who are who are the excellent people whose experience we need represented in Parliament. And I think it's so, so, so important that people don't feel that they need to be an elite in any profession in order to access public office. We need people from all ages and stages mm -hmm. because they bring such valuable experience. And I, I really think that it's upon all of us to try and work to make sure that all of our seats of government look as much like the country they represent as possible. My, my friend Zach has just texted to say, Ian, you're just a posh Essex boy. And he's, he's, I don't, th I don't think I'm posh, but... So is that true? Yeah, I am from Essex, <laughs> but I hide it well. But were you born posh? Did you become posh no, or did I you have poshness I, thrust upon I'm, you? I'm not posh. I went to a comprehensive school. I went to the University of... My producer says, Mary, you are posh. Well, <laughs> my mother would love it for everyone to think that I was posh. She, really? She wanted me to change my name to have a double-barrowed name because she thought it would help me get on in life. Or was yeah. that name going to be? Ian Campbell Deal. Oh. Because I'm a quarter Scottish, John. I'm not sure if you were I did know... I don't, didn't know that I mean, time. voices are important. When I first joined LBC, um, somebody said, you need to change your voice. And I thought, well, I've got the job on my current voice. I don't think I'm oh. going to change it. But sometimes you have to sort of pace it up a bit because I have a bit of a soporific voice. Well, at least they didn't say you've got a face for radio. Oh, no, they said that as well. 8.46. This is LBC.
Ireland. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 10 to 9 on LBC. John Burr, John Nicholson, Kate Maltby and Ella Robertson Mackay with me. Um, Gordon wants to remind you, John Nicholson, that he asked a question in the audience on your programme, Open to Question. My goodness. It says it was back in the 1980s when you, you would have been a slip of a lad, I suspect. It was straight out of university and I got asked if I would uh, do this series where famous people would be grilled by school kids. And my Ooh. goodness, they were they were tough. In the audience were a couple of folk you might have heard of as school kids. Uh, Christian Guru Murthy, oh, really? uh, Sarah Smith yeah. and Hardeep Singh Kohli Ooh. were all in the audience asking tough Precocious questions. Precocious as ever. They certainly were and they asked some. Mary Whitehouse got a terrible, terrible hard time from these kids. Oh, bless her. Right, let's go to your next question. It is from Harry in Waltham Forest. Harry, what would you like to ask? Good evening, good evening, panel. Hello. Uh, does the panel think that an MP crossing the House should lead to an automatic by-election? I feel as if we did this three weeks ago, but there we are. Um, Ella? Absolutely. I think if you're going to change political party, a lot of people will have voted for you because of the logo next to your name on the ballot. And I think people who... If you go to citizen independent, that's one matter. But if you change political party, it should absolutely trigger a by-election and your constituents have got every right to get rid of you. Kate. So, morally, yes. I'm always rather appalled when MPs cross the floor and they don't call a by-election. But technically, there is one really good counter-argument that I think gets forgot here, which is that if you tie a change in the whip, if you, if you, if you introduce the kind of legislation that would make, it make this automatic, it would be very, very hard to create a situation where MPs don't automatically face a by-election when their party removes the whip from them. And that creates a huge amount of blackmail and actually increases the central the power of central parties over potentially quite healthily rebellious MPs. I don't think it has to be tied to the whip because um, without getting boringly technical, you do need to be a member of a political party in order to represent it in, in the House. And I think if you, are, if you change your party membership, that could trigger the by-election. It doesn't need to be linked yeah, to the Yeah, but you whip. can be thrown out of your party as well. Well, I think if, you, if you're thrown out of your party for breaking your code of conduct for something, harassment or something like that, that's that also a very serious John? issue. Well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? The party receiving the MP always says, absolutely not, no need whatsoever, delightful to have this person with us. And the party losing says, of course, we must have a by-election, regardless of what decade we're living in. This has been an argument that's gone on forever. I mean, I suppose Mr Speaker uh, would, uh, would uh, say that actually you're elected as an individual. You might have a party colour attached to you. And of course, we all know that you would not have been elected without that party colour. But the tradition has always been that uh, the MP remains until the next election, when almost invariably they will lose their seats. We've got two who've dropped out at the moment and joined the Alapa party, Alex Salmond's party. And, um, that worked well. Pardon? That worked well for them. <laughs> yes, 1.666% at the last election. I don't know, is there a significance to that figure? I think let's not go there. John Bird. Well, I, I mean, I, I I agree with Ian. Is Ian, sorry, John, John, sorry, um, sorry. Um, he I wishes think, he was Ian because Ian is <laughs> Ian is Scottish. For Ian and Gallic. It's Ian and Gallic. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say that you vote for an MP, uh, you vote for the person. You don't vote for the party. Though most people who do vote for an MP believe they're voting for the party. So there is that contradiction. And I think the thing is that as long as a person is in Parliament, then in a way you have to accept the fact that they are there because they were voted for at one particular time, that when, it, when, the, uh, when the vote was taken, and they should be there till the end of the Parliament. So I wouldn't, you know, call for a general, sorry, a by-election immediately. Right, let's, um, th Harry, would you like to answer your own question? Uh, yes, if they cross the floor of the House, then they should immediately automatically go to a by-election just to give the electorate a chance to reaffirm their original vote. OK, thank you very much. Uh, tweet question from McKevin. Do the panel think that attacks on Carrie Johnson are desperately weak and a form of bullying? Kate. So again, I think this is a question we need to separate out into two halves. Um, 
One thing that's clear about Carrie Simons, as was, she's a hardened political operator. She's worked in politics all her life, which incidentally makes her a perfectly appropriate person to advise the PM. She's been advising PMs professionally for some time now. Um, and that also should mean that she should be the subject of legitimate scrutiny. And I think in particular, and what has affected my thinking on this a lot, is if there are questions about her use of the Downing Street flat at a time when all the rest of us were cooped up, in lockdown, it's perfectly reasonable she should face scrutiny on that. However, yes, there are there is a line of attack, and I've written about this before, which is just, it's the oldest stereotypes in the book. You know, Marie Antoinette, Anne Boleyn, Lady Macbeth. If someone is using a really old stereotype of a nasty woman to attack a modern woman, then that should tell you straight away that there is some lazy and traditionally prejudiced thinking going on that actually detracts from, as I say, the slightly more real questions that are fair enough to, um, you know, to, to, to throw at any serious political figure in Downing Street. I was reading Sarah Vine's column in the Mail on Sunday on this, where she she was married to Michael Gove, and she clearly thinks that the scrutiny that she came under um, contributed to the failure of their marriage. And you think, well, OK, she's a public figure, she's a columnist in the Mail, sort of inevitably you are going to get some things thrown at you. But Ella, do you, th do you think all is fair in love and politics? I think that the way Kate framed it as legitimate criticism or legitimate scrutiny, there is legitimate scrutiny to people who are who surround key elements of power. And I think there are certain questions that are fair to ask, but I think the tone of the questions and the um, acerbic and really demeaning writing that, that's been, I've seen online from Lord Ashcross's book, for example, is just completely unnecessary. It's tabloid gossip whipped up to sell books, and I certainly wouldn't be buying that book. Um, I think that, I think it's it's a really difficult thing for anyone in public life because you realise that you're going to have to put your, you know, beloved spouse or partner and potentially even your children up for scrutiny that they don't sign up for at all. And you know, look, Carrie Johnson has had two children since the start of the pandemic and anyone who's got two children under two will know that doesn't leave you a lot of time for interfering in the machinations of running the country. Well, if she is giving him advice, it's not very good advice at the moment, isn't it? Um, John Bird. Well, I, I, I'm a bit lost here because, you know, I don't, you know, I'm sorry, but I have not got into the detail of uh, what's happening in number 10 because I am still outraged about what's happened over the gravy train. It's yesterday's news, so I haven't really got into the detail. But I do believe that if somebody like Carrie Johnson marries a man, that don't pass all of the grief of the man over to the wife. That's what I think the problem is. And often problems do get exported. And I would like to think that anybody who was looking at Carrie Johnson would be looking at the evidence of what she has or she hasn't done. But I think so many people have written off number 10 at the moment that there's not probably mu not much chance of having a, a legitimate discussion okay. about this. John? If Carrie Johnson is a private person, why was she at a work party? And on that bombshell? Well, I, I've taken my wife to uh, two private parties, to, not during, to public parties. Not during COVID restrictions. It, it's also, oh, no. it's also no. the garden of her private residence. You know, I, I, it's not, you know, the, it, if, she'd been it a, is a, if, if you or I had been in the garden of our private residence during lockdown with that number of people, we would have been prosecuted by the police. She it, can't have it both ways. She can't both be a completely private uh, uh, person, but also escape responsibility for attending a work event. Right, let's move on to our final text question from Beth in Clapham. Gito Harry and Boris Johnson apparently sang I Will Survive together. What would you be singing with the Prime Minister? Kate. Do you know I had a really bad cold this week, so I think I've diplomatically lost my voice. Oh, that's a cop out. Disappointing. John. Well, it wouldn't be hasty back, would it? I imagine it would be, i uh, borrow a football anthem. Cheerio, cheerio, cheerio. OK. Ella? I've got to say, get this party started did come to mind. But I think, yeah, maybe high hopes. I think that's probably captures the vibe in the party at the moment. John? Well, I, I would like to bring in Ian Dury with something like they ain't half been some clever bastards <laughs> just to describe the nature 
of most governments. You said that 20 seconds before the watershed. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into terrible trouble for that. Um, apologies if anyone was offended. I think I would choose a song by the South African group Mango Groove, which goes, This is not a party. Blah, blah, blah. What a, what a wonderful way to end the programme. Uh, John Bird, John Nicholson, Kate Maltby, Ella robertson Mackay. thank you very much for joining us. If you missed any of the show, and also you can catch up on previous Cross Questions on the Cross Question podcast feed or on the LBC YouTube channel or on Global Player. We'll have another one tomorrow at 8 o'clock. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's 9 o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, two people have been arrested after the Labour leader became surrounded by protesters near Parliament. Were you protecting Jimmy Sir Keir Starmer had to be driven away in a police car earlier this evening. The shadow foreign secretary was also heckled. LBC's Westminster correspondent Ben Kentish has more. Keir Starmer and David Lammy unhurt, but it was pretty angry. It was pretty unpleasant when you watch those videos.